So uh, today uh, I would like to present uh, our lecture on the use of ultra high performance supercritical fluid chromatography MS for high throughput lipidomic quantitation. So first of all, SFC is not, not a new technique at all. It's known for decades, but within uh, last years, it was huge improvements in instrumentation, robustness, and reproducibility, which caused the spreading of this instrumentation over chromatographic labs. And today I would like to explain you her first few technical details what are real advantages of the use of supercritical fluids for chromatography? So I'm starting uh, with this basic school example of phase diagram. Uh, here you see the dependence of pressure on temperature. And this point is called critical point. So if you are above the critical temperature and critical pressure, then you go to so-called supercritical region. So for carbon dioxide, these conditions are pretty mild. 31 degrees centigrade and 74 bars. This is relatively normal. And you should also consider that during the separation, especially with modifiers, you often go to subcritical region here, but it does not matter concerning the mechanism and reproducibility. Uh, so it's important to realize what are these special characteristics of supercritical fluids. So if you compare first uh, viscosity of supercritical fluids, uh, which are quite close to gas, uh, concerning the density, uh, density is relatively close to liquid. Uh, and diffusivity is something in between these values, but still relatively high. It means uh, that supercritical fluid is taking advantages from both gas chromatography and liquid chromatography. It means high diffusivity is causing high analysis speed and low viscosity, high resolution. So you have both and uh, you have faster analysis and still keeping very high resolution, which is definitely a big advantage for chromatography. Uh, so concerning the potential of SFC or ultra high performance SFC, it means with sub to micron uh, particle columns, uh, at the moment is relatively evident. But uh, nowadays, we may really claim that reproducibility and robustness of commercial systems is fully compatible with UHPLC. And this is the main reason why more attention is paid to SFC nowadays. Uh, with SFC, we have absolutely no problems with pressure limits. So if you compare the typical back pressures with SFC, with LC, so these are much lower. It means uh, that we may increase uh, the flow rate and we are doing this, but on these fundamental curves, we see that the plateau is really, uh, really flat. It means that increase of the linear velocity, it means flow rate, is not causing any loss of resolution, which is very important. So you may have fast and efficient analysis. MS coupling is routine, and by the principle, SFC is a perfect deal for molecules containing uh, large hydrophobic parts, that means lipids, because they may be well separated. Some basic facts about uh, selected uh, supercritical fluids. In practice, mainly carbon dioxide is used with these uh, relatively moderate values as shown previously, but there are also some other options uh, with not so high values but in practice, in commercial systems, just carbon dioxide is used due to the several obvious advantages. Carbon dioxide is non-toxic, non-flammable, non-corrosive. And concerning the polarity, the polarity is like for hexane or heptane. It means totally non-polar. So for the elution of polar analytes like phospholipids, fingolipids, we need to add polar modifiers, but these modifiers are easily miscible with uh, supercritical carbon dioxide. So the match for chromatography is quite good. Here is the scheme of uh, SFC instrumentation. So uh, in, uh, in general, it's more or less the same like for LC, but there are just few differences which I would like to highlight. So we have the bottle, the tank of carbon dioxide here and with special pump for ca carbon liquid carbon dioxide. Then we have the modifier, like in normal chromatography, mixer, auto sampler, columns, and so on. And a new feature is this red one, automatic back pressure regulator. 
because we must control uh, the back pressure in the system to keep uh, the carbon dioxide under supercritical conditions. So we must use some type of restrictor here to keep regulated and reproducible pressure over the whole system. And basically the advancement in technology is caused by advancement in this automatic back pressure regulator. There are three major options used for interfacing SFCMS. In reality, there are a couple more, but these are most useful and most widely used. Uh, of course, this strongly depends on the vendor. Yeah. For example, one vendor is offering only this last solution, another vendor is providing all options, but in general, the last one is the most widespread. First is the simplest, but maybe not the best, direct coupling that uh, the back pressure regulator is just in between the column and mass spectrometer. So there is no possibility uh, just to add some suitable makeup solvent or control the flow or whatever. So this is not used so frequently, but some people favor it. Then uh, we may have a splitter. Uh, and then this uh, one branch from splitter is going to mass spectrometer, the second one uh, to back pressure regulator. So this should provide uh, higher sensitivity because there is no dilution due to makeup solvent uh, and lower flow rate for electro spray. But uh, here in the last one, we have two TPCs. It means that first one is used for the introduction of suitable makeup flow with uh, defined polarity, and you may add agents for improvement, the ionization efficiency, and so on. And then the second one, where the part is going to waste, this is basically the splitter. And this one is uh, used most frequently. And for example, for waters, so this is the only solution, and this seems to be quite flexible. Uh, sorry. So concerning the method development uh, in SFCMS, it's more or less the same or very similar to conventional LCMS method development. So we have to select the stationary phase, the mobile phase, modifiers, typically some alcohols. It's quite important to add some suitable additives for ionization. Uh, then uh, we need to carefully consider which sample solvent uh, we will use and uh, optimize a couple of other parameters, including the optimization of uh, ion source parameters. So now I'm going to explain the optimization of key parameters using the real examples. So uh, first, the overview of stationary phases. The first rule is clear. clear. Uh, you may use any conventional LC column what you have in your laboratory. So it's easily possible without any problem. You just wash it with carbon dioxide and you can use it without any limitation. There are also dedicated SFC columns, but uh, th there is no reason why common columns uh, could not be used. So we, we have two possibilities to use either a chiral or chiral separation. Here, uh, much preferred mode uh, is a helic like mode. It means the use of polar stationary phases like silica or modified medium polar uh, silica functionalities. The use of uh, octadecyl silica gel in so called reverse phase mode is slightly less common here because it's not true reverse phase but mixed mode yeah, uh, because the mechanism is not completely the same like in reverse phase. Concerning the chiral separation, there is huge potential uh, because the separations are faster compared to LC and often more efficient. So pharmaceutical industry, for example, is heavily implementing the chiral, L L uh, chiral SFC methodologies, and probably there is also potential for lipidomics. Concerning the mobile phases, uh, so the carbon dioxide is the main component, uh, as non-polar one, and then polar modifier, typically alcohols, methanol, ethanol, uh, isopropanol, and other possibilities as well. So when we mix alcohol with carbon dioxide, uh, the mobile phase will have acidic character due to the formation of alkyl carbonic acid, so the apparent pH value around 4 to 5. So it means that acidic compounds uh, will be well separated without tailing here. 
additives are the same as for LC. There is no real difference between LC and SFC. But here you may go slightly higher with concentrations uh, because uh, the proportion of modifier in the mobile phase is very low. So you can easily go to 30 or even 50 millimoles due to dilution with carbon dioxide. And then you have a couple of other possibilities how to influence the selectivity, considering the different uh, mechanisms of separation like ion exchange, ion pairing, or whatever. So I'm not going into these details. So here is the first uh, important consideration, you may call it as a trick, that you really need to pay attention to sample solvent for SFC because the elution power cannot be higher compared to your mobile phase. So it means that it should be relatively non-polar. For example, here, heptane with isopropanol 921, perfect uh, peak shape, no fronting. But when you increase the polarity of your solvent, it may cause you problems with peak shape and with fronting and widening, and it may completely kill your separation. So only polar solvents or even including the water, this is not acceptable for injection. You should keep injection volume relatively small. Here you see the other fine tuning of the ratio. Uh, so you really need to pay more attention uh, to the solvent used for the solution of your sample. Also optimization of washing liquids that's important as well. Uh, the second trick uh, is uh, that uh, you should add uh, some water uh, to your modifier because without any water in your modifier, some people observed difficulties with reproducibility. But when you add about one to five or even more percent of water, the reproducibility is uh, excellent. In our case, uh, we typically have even much better reproducibility than shown here in this relatively older paper, I would say six years old. Uh, this is the separation, what I have shown already in my first presentation from our first published paper using uh, silica gel column with sub to micron particles, uh, using uh, super critical carbon dioxide and modifier, methanol water, 1% of water and 30 millimoles of ammonium acetate. So you can see a really nice separation of non-polar lipid classes and excellent sensitivity, and also uh, good separation of polar lipid classes with sensitivity comparable uh, to LC as well. So now I'm going towards the quantitation and I have to talk about internal standards. So the generic rule is to use at least one internal standard for each class. We prefer to use at least two or more at the moment. So of course, internal standard must be added before any sample handling. And as explained by Gerhard Liebisch, internal standard and analyte should be ionized at the same time to avoid problems with different matrix effects, which is well, uh, uh, which is easily achieved by lipid class separation like helix or SFC. Here, uh, you may see the current method, what we are using a little bit faster and higher throughput, so we are able to analyze daily up to 200 samples. And this is just example of uh, system suitability standard here. Okay, at the beginning, uh, we have started with the very systematic optimization of all parameters in the methodology, starting from the sample preparation. We have compared uh, these six uh, liquid extraction protocols uh, based on chloroform, MTB, um, uh, butanol hexane, butanol methanol, free phase or monophasic protocol. So in our case, the best results were achieved by Folch uh, protocol, what we are using formally. But you may notice that relatively good numbers are obtained for monophasic protocol as well. But this is something what I would not recommend to use because what you cannot see in these numbers that there is much higher contamination of your mass spec because this is basically just dissolution without any purification of your sample. So if you analyze 10 lipid extracts per week, that's fine. But if you wish to analyze 100 samples per week, then you will have huge contamination. So think twice before using this protocol. Important parameter is also dissolving solvent. So you see here that, for example, if you use MTBE, you are losing completely the sensitivity. We are using chloroform methanol. 
Another parameters are shown here, the pH value used for the extraction. Uh, so differences are not huge, but the best was obtained for ammonium carbonate. And then the choice of uh, diluting solvents. Uh, again, here, the differences are not so big, but the best was obtained for hexane isopropanol chloroform, followed by chloroform methanol. What we are using for the reason that we don't wish to include hexane in the methodology because it's extremely volatile and not miscible with water. So we wish to avoid the problems. We have developed a system of uh, quality control, multi-step quality control during the online measurements. So when you analyze hundreds of biological extracts uh, per week, then you should really monitor uh, your signal. So here uh, you see the response for one internal standard, tosylyl choline 14.0, 14.0, and you see that uh, after a couple of hundreds of injections, the signal is slightly falling down. This is of course natural due to contamination. But if you use multiple internal standards per class, then you can normalize it using the second internal standard. And then you see that uh, the uh, concentration of this internal standard in individual extracts is almost constant. The same can be done for endogenous lipids. And then you perfectly normalize the concentrations based on the use of internal standards. Of course, we also inject the quality control, uh, NIST plasma or other system standards and so on is described in this paper. So I'm not going into details here. For all clinical methods, what we are using, uh, we perform the full method validation in line with FDA and EMA uh, recommendations for bioanalytical validations. So I'm not going to explain you all the details for all these parameters, uh, which was also published and you can follow, but I will explain just about three major parameters. So first one is the recovery for a liquid liquid extraction using folk method. And uh, here we have measured concentrations of internal standards at low, medium and high concentration levels. And to calculate the recovery, you have to spike before extraction and after extraction. Then you compare and you determine the percentage. So here you see that except of uh, two minor exceptions, uh, all values are within these uh, defined uh, interval by guidelines. So that's so you can claim that the recovery for all classes is really very good. A very important parameter is uh, matrix suppression, which is measured uh, by parameters called matrix effect and matrix factor. Here, we again measure at all concentration levels and we compare uh, the spike sample after extraction compared with diluted neat standard in pure solvent. And then you correlate it. So for SFC, uh, you may observe for many polar phosphorin sphingolipids that there is quite strong iron enhancement. So you see the strongest example here for sphingomyelin, 178% which means that this increases your sensitivity, but uh, this is no exclusion criterion as long as this is reproducible. So you have to determine the matrix factor, which is percentage of RSD of matrix effect. And then you see that you are below 10% in all cases, except for one failure for monoacylglycerols with helic methodology. This is this light green curve. Blue is uh, SFC. Okay, uh, so then and the determination of precision, accuracy, and low limit of quantitation. So we use the regression equation uh, from calibration curve. And this way we calculate the concentrations of individual uh, uh, calibration points, so called back calculation, and also samples spiked at all concentration levels in line with these rules and uh, following these guidelines. And then based on this, you calculate uh, accuracies and precisions for individual concentration levels. And again, you should be below 15% or below 20 for low limit of quantitation and below 15 for other points. So all these things are fulfilled in line with, uh, with the guidelines. 
Last, uh, this boring slide on this uh, validation parameters is selectivity and carryover. So th the selectivity is basically the verification of suitability of your internal standards. And here's the question whether uh, your metrics uh, effects or system interferences can be significant for your internal standard. So first you inject blank metrics without any internal standard. It's shown here and there is just highlighted window for this internal standard. And then after uh, you inject metrics spiked with internal standard after extraction and uh, at low concentration level, of course, and then you see it here. And uh, according to guideline, you should be below 20% and there is absolutely nothing. So selectivity is perfect. And this has to be done for all internal standards. And then carryover, it means the verification of whether you have some contamination from previous injections. It means that you have uh, to inject the calibration point uh, spiked at high concentration level first, it's shown here. And then after this, immediately you inject solvent blank, it means nothing. And he here you see again, even after magnification, that it's absolutely zero. So it means that you can use it for quantitation. So if I summarize uh, all these things, uh, we have performed the full validation for both methods using the same sample set, the same sequence, uh, the comparable MS conditions as close as possible for plasma, serum, and we are using multiple internal standards per class. And we may conclude that the results between SFC and Helic are, I would say, more or less very close. It's slightly better for SFC, but no huge difference. Now I would like to explain one important uh, difference between HILIC and SFC. In case of HILIC or LC in general, you introduce the whole eluent or effluent to mass spectrometer without splitting typically. In case of SFC, a splitter is common for some configurations, but the electrospray is supposed to be concentration detector. So it should be no loss of sensitivity, but in reality, small loss is observed because some sample is going to waste. And you need to also control um, that split ratio could theoretically change during the gradient. But the advantage is explained here on these two figures. Uh, when you have splitter, you inject less, uh, I would say contamination to your mass spec. So mass spec is less contaminated. So it results in higher robustness. So if you inject system suitability standard, after a couple of injections. So here, for example, we may have like thousand injections and you see only drop of signal, only 11%. So for Helic, where you inject everything, the signal uh, intensity loss is much higher. This is verified on multiple instruments using uh, done several times. So we are really confident with this. And this is quite significant advantage when you wish to do really high throughput for many clinical samples. My colleague Dennis Wallerab did uh, this experiment of repeatability that she measured like 500 samples and repeated everything the same after like half of a year using completely the same protocol. And here you see principal uh, component analysis, uh, statistical models. And if you look on these numbers, you may see that outliers are identical for both methods. And you may see even uh, comparison of concentrations so we really know that uh, we have quite good, uh, quite high level of uh, repeatability and robustness of this system. And she also checked uh, 126 lipid species quantified in these samples coming from a healthy cohort and three types of cancer. And here you see that RSD is typically lower than 10 or 20 for majority of samples. And this is highlighted for one dysregulated lipid in cancer, so then you see that between the first and second analysis, half of a year later, we see quite good correlation and robustness. And again, uh, the same can be shown for whole data set. Uh, the next example is showing uh, how stable is the human lipidome during the period of one year. So there are three blood collections, time zero after six and 12 months for about 100 volunteers. And you see RSDs, 
so for polar lipids, phospholipids and sphingolipids, it's typically below 10 or 20 percent, but much higher variation is observed for dry and dye acylglycerols, which is probably related to nutrition and eating habits of individual people. And this, by the way, tells you that uh, the use of uh, triacylglycerols as biomarkers of some diseases is quite questionable, except for some specific fat-related diseases, but for example, for cancer or whatever, this is not so logical to consider TG because the variability is really very high. Uh, QC control samples were below 10% uh, RSD in all cases. So we have done a lot of uh, comparisons uh, concerning the different uh, collection tubes for serum, plasma, EDTA, heparin, free collections, and all of these things were correlated as shown here. And uh, we are really uh, confident uh, that these data are totally reproducible and does not matter which biological type of sample is used. But of course, for individual cohorts, uh, we are selecting just the same protocol, but theoretically, we know that the difference should not be uh, too high. And now, uh, at the end of my presentation, I would like to present uh, one uh, application example, our study on uh, pancreatic uh, cancer biomarkers, where we have performed uh, three phases of this research, starting from the discovery, where we have first noticed that there are such differences using just one collection site, measured in one laboratory, using three different methods shown here. Then we continued to phase two qualification. We have invited two other laboratories uh, using four different methods, an extended sample set, always red color means pancreatic cancer, blue is healthy, and green is uh, pancreatitis as the most common comorbidity. And finally, uh, the verification phase, it means data from four different collection sites measured just one laboratory and one method. So first, the discovery phase. Uh, so we have measured 364 samples. And in blue, uh, you see healthy controls. And these other colors uh, starting from uh, yellow, uh, cancer stage one, up to uh, brown, uh, higher uh, uh, later cancer stages. So you can see that in these OPLSD models uh, separately for males and females, we have really nice uh, group separation. So of course, the next question was, isn't it artificial or can we repeat it uh, for different sample set by different methodologies and different laboratories or whatever? So the next step was the invitation of cooperators from Germany, Gerhard Liebig Group and Markus Bank from Singapore. And then we used four methods in parallel. SFC in our group, uh, Lowers and Hires Shotgun by Gerhard and Reverse Face LCMS by Singapore Group. In total, we used over 500 samples and we used these instruments. And what are the results? Uh, so, pretty encouraging. We may claim that lipid profiles and concentrations are quite comparable uh, among different methods. I don't say absolutely the same, but quite comparable. Dysregulation patterns are absolutely the same. And by individual methods, we are obtaining similar sensitivity and specificity values. So if you look here, one of the most dysregulated lipids along sphingomyelins with one double bond, 411, but the same may be observed for many other long sphingomyelins. Then you see uh, individual number means the number of method and laboratory ABC, blue is healthy, red is cancer. So you see that these profiles are quite comparable. And uh, if you consider just lipid class separation, we don't need even normalization. And with normalization, we may compare even among lipid class and lipid species methods to obtain this picture. And of course, we have uh, prepared also ROC curves uh, for training sets and validation sets. It means blinded samples. So mostly we are above uh, 0.9 values so which is quite good. So the next and final step so far was the phase three verification. It means uh, more samples from four different collection sites. And here we include much more variability. 
uh, samples are before therapy, after therapy, before after surgery. We include also controls, more samples for pancreatitis. We consider samples with diabetes, multiple collections, and so on. So even in this case, uh, the method is not, uh, not collapsing. Uh, so you see even uh, here on the principal component analysis, it means uh, non-supervised statistics. So quality controls are in one position and there is already uh, just minor group separation even here, but for uh, supervised OPLSDA methods, we have the parameters presented here first for training sets and then for validation sets. Of course, males and females are again separated because we know that it increases slightly uh, the sensitivities and specificities by about two, three percent. So theoretically, it would be possible to do it also together, but we slightly lose uh, the accuracy. Uh, I forgot uh, to emphasize uh, here to look at these yellow or orange points, which means early stages, where is the only possibility uh, to help these people with possible treatment, because for later stages, there is, uh, at the moment, unfortunately, no clinical option. But we see that for these early stages, we don't see problems. Yeah. So they are typically in the middle. And we don't see decreased accuracies for early stages, which is extremely important information. And this is highlighted also here on two selected uh, dysregulated lipids that if we separate the group of cancer samples for early stages, this lighter, uh, lighter red color and uh, late stages, this brown color, that you don't see uh, any significant differences. And here I add also the column of pancreatitis. There are not so many samples, honestly, uh, and we need to extend this, but obviously you see that it's much closer to healthy controls. But if you see just a single dysregulated lipid, you should not call it just biomarker because with this you cannot differentiate sufficiently. You definitely need multivariate data analysis. It means advanced statistical tools to obtain these accuracies over 90%. So, okay, just final concluding remarks on SFC methodology. Uh, so I would claim uh, based on uh, our work within the last couple of years that method development is comparable, repeatability, reproducibility, more or less the same. And for high throughput quantitation, we are a little bit faster. And for non polylipid classes like triacylglycerols, diacylglycerols, cholesterol esters, it's a really nice separation and excellent sensitivity. So finally, I would like uh, to acknowledge the work of uh, all other people from my group who contributed financial support. And uh, if you are interested, we have published already a couple of papers on SFC where we have described all these discussed issues. So I am ready to answer any questions if we still have some time. <laughs>